Uh, I would like to present you the Austrian strategy for restoring river continuity. Um, as you hear, see here, uh, only uh, 30, let's say 35 percent uh, of the Austrian rivers are in high or good status or in good ecological potential. So it means that uh, more than two thirds of the Austrian rivers are failing the objective of the good status. So the reason for this is we are an alpine country. We don't have uh, any uh, specific uh, primary energy resources like oil and gas. We have hydropower and an alpine country, flood defense is also a big issue for us. So we have uh, 33,000 uh, continuity eruptions in the rivers of the catchment area, more than 10,000 uh, 10 square kilometers. That means one barrier each kilometer. 10% um, of them are due to hydropower stations. We have uh, also the problem with the connectivity of the river with regard to reduced flows. 10% uh, of our river net are not passable for fish due to reduced flows. Uh, we have uh, hydro peaking, uh, water level fluctuations, which are affecting 2% of our river net. We are, uh, have hydropower plants, runoff river plants, which have a ponding effect in the rivers which are affecting 4% of our rivers and additional general morphological alterations due to flood defense, uh, which are affecting one quarter of our river net. So quite a big challenge, a lot to do. And therefore, we needed a strategy how to achieve the, the objectives of the good ecological status. Uh, this strategy was laid down in our first river basin management plan which was published in 2009. And this uh, management plan included the program from measures. And these measures, we decided uh, on the assessment, the evaluation of the biological effectiveness of, of our methods, of the costs and the possible impacts on uses. And it was clear for us that we need for the implementation uh, to change our legal regulations to make a prioritization because as you see we have a lot to do think of 33,000 barriers we have to restore the the continuity so we need a prioritization we also need financial support if you ask someone to pay for something it's clear nobody wants to pay for it you also need financial support to bring things uh, going on and additional supporting tools uh, technical supporting tools and tools which will raise the awareness and acceptance by those people uh, who have to do something. Uh, with regard to legal, legal regulations, we changed our law and we included in our National Water Act that uh, a river continuity has to be ensured at every obstacle, at every construction we have in all rich rivers where we have natural fish habitats. That means river continuity is obliged to be taken into account everywhere except those very high mountain rivers where natural fish do not live. And this requirement for river continuity is also including that there is a flow requirement that fish can pass the river. And this requirement this uh, statement uh, saying it's state of the art to uh, ensure river continuity is relevant not only for new constructions, new obstacles, but also for the existing ones. That means uh, any obstacle has to be restored. The only question is when. When is the deadline they have to restore it? Uh, we also included in a so-called quality objective ordinance, which is uh, regulating the assessment of the ecological status. We declared that for good ecological status, uh, anthropogenic migration barriers must be passable for fish and all the year long, for all the year. And the human impact of half of that connectivity in case of a good ecological status, which we have to achieve, shall only be marginal. 
It is also clear for us that river continuity is usually required for heavily modified water bodies. That is a requirement for achieving good ecological potential. And we also included or changed our National um, uh, Water Regulations Water Act that we have a possibility to change existing permits. Because if we can't do it, we cannot achieve or, or oblige someone to do restoration. And according to the prioritization, a lot to do where we should start first. And we relied on ecological criteria. And uh, we, we, we said for the first river basin management, for the first cycle, we uh, will restore the continuity in the, in the larger rivers with a catchment area of more than 100 square kilometers. And those larger rivers where they are the habitats of the medium distance migrators. Um, in Austria, we don't have long distance migrators like the salmon or the eel. We might have the sturgeon, but due to Iron Gate uh, and Gapchikova, uh, logically, these fish cannot come to Austria again. Uh, only in the case there, the, the, the continuity is restored at that tense. So we decided the medium distance migrators are in Austria the mo most dangerous fish. And the large rivers are under highest pressures. So we will start the continuity restoration and then in the next cycles move him upwards to the middle parts, to the smaller rivers, because usually the, to open the corridor should start from the lower part upstream to the higher parts, to the, the smaller parts of the rivers. And uh, we spe in specifically focused on, on the uh, Danube salmon, the hucho hucho, the nose and the barbel. These are the most important rivers and you can see here on the map these green rivers are those where we have set the priority for a continuity continuity restoration in the first river basin management plan. Um, and how, we, how did we really made it operative? Because if you say we want to restore, how can we push people to really do something? So uh, most of our regional governments made a specific ordinance for continuity restoration, declaring exactly in which river stretches uh, continuity has to be restored, taking this map uh, as, a, as a basis, and then uh, the, it, it declaring that the owner of a permit of a license has to submit a restoration project on river continuity. That means uh, those uh, which are responsible for obstacles or insufficient flows, and they have to submit it within two years. And if they don't, they would lease uh, they will uh, lose the license, the license would expire. So it's a very, very strong push to do something. Uh, and uh, I think it was very good for Austria to really achieve, uh, make a big step forward for restoration. It is also clear that for financing, we need additional uh, support. Of course, we are following the polluter pays principle. Who causes a problem? That one has to pay for it. But to have a financial incentive to start the restoration even uh, earlier than they are forced to. We have some financial incentives, subsidy for investments, for example, for fish migration aids. And we also use the synergies with the, the measures which are financed by the flood management fund uh, and we also use EU funds like LIFE uh, or the Agricultural Rural Development Fund. Additional supporting tools uh, with, tech, uh, with regard to, to te te technical things or acceptance. I would just give an example. Uh, we developed a guidance uh, for building fish migration aid to harmonize all the activities and make sure, sure on the nationwide level what is necessary that the fish pass it will, which will be, have to be built is well functioning. So we, we made um, um, uh, obligations for the accessibility, for the passability, design criteria. We, we clarified what fish species is a relevant, relevant ones. 
uh, and all of the time of secured functioning is, um, is laid down in these guidelines. And for example, for uh, uh, um, raising the acceptance, uh, we have uh, built, uh, uh, developed uh, advisory services in different regional governments to minimize the negative effects on the hydro, small hydropower companies. Uh, and uh, uh, the advisory service was, uh, was done in, in to, to increase the efficiency of the uh, electricity production and at the same time to improve the ecology. They also got the information on the subsidies. Uh, usually uh, the a company, a hydropower company, gets the advice for one day free. They have nothing to pay for it. And to really, uh, the, the reason is to find so-called win-win solutions, to, to increase the output from the electricity point of view and also to uh, uh, increase or improve the ecology. And for example, it turned out that uh, due to these advisory services and due to the modernization which was done, uh, uh, there was an, on the average an increase of 30% of the electricity generation, even for example, that uh, they are now uh, um, ensuring the ecological flow. So it was not a loss combined with modernization, it's even an increase. And also, if you use uh, so-called residual water turbines to use the, uh, additional electricity production for this ecological flow, also can avoid uh, losses in production. Um, what were, was the crucial for us, uh, and I think a very good uh, solution we made, uh, the discussion with the relevant stakeholders, and hydropower in particular, started already in 2001. Uh, right after the Water Framework Directive came into force. We had a lot of sectors meeting uh, with all sectors relevant in, in, the, in, the, in the Framework Directive in the field of water, but uh, in particular with the hydropower sector. We have a so-called round table water, which usually meets twice a year, where all stakeholders uh, are sitting together and discussing their uh, uh, interests as well. And I think one crucial uh, thing was we made joint studies, studies together with the hydropower sector so that every one of, of the both parties can rely on the results. We made studies together to identify and quantify the negative effects on users and we did it uh, via scenarios to really find out and can show to the politician what does it mean, uh, what does it cost, because if you ask someone, uh, are you able to, to finance it, everyone would say no, it would cost too much. Uh, the, the, the thing was to really find arguments based on facts and not on political positions. And we did it together, together in studies, and we also made the studies on the cost effectiveness uh, of restoration measures, which is uh, just starting now. We made, for example, a um, 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 study together to find out appropriate measures uh, for uh, mitigate hydropeaking effects. And that was for us really crucial. And all these uh, uh, studies were published uh, by, by the ministry, uh, but also accepted and financed by the hydropower companies, uh, for example. What was the success, or was there an ex success of our strategy? Uh, as you remember, we said for these uh, priori prioritized river stretches, we will restore the continuity uh, till 2015. And yes, up to uh, next year, 1,000 uh, 1, migration barriers at 1,000 uh, migration barriers, the upstream continuity will be restored. Uh, that means uh, the continuity at uh, about 400 hydropower plants. The others uh, are mig uh, migration barriers due to flood events constructions. Um, and uh, I think uh, we heard yesterday that uh, the environment agency is expecting uh, 10,000 um, 
barriers to be uh, restored, the continuity restored uh, in the first river basin management cycle. So even uh, Austria has not a territory of t one tenth uh, of the European area, but we achieved already one tenth of this uh, objective of 10,000 uh, migration barriers to be resolved. And we also uh, um, were successful in increasing the flow uh, to restore the possibility in, in, uh, in, in the water, in the rivers, where we have uh, water extraction due to hydro plant, power plants. So it seems that we are on a good way. And uh, we also, of course, included or uh, did a lot of habitat improvements. More than 300 measures were set. Uh, but it has turned out, and we have learned from the past, uh, it is uh, any, any uh, habitat improvement uh, will not work if the continuity is not restored. So to reopen the corridors, though that uh, the fish can migrate and can achieve, the, uh, then can access the habitats, is very uh, important. And our work will be continued in the secondary basin management plan. Our restoration act activities will go further upstream to open uh, the rivers to the smaller ones as well. Uh, yeah, and I hope uh, that uh, this can give you a good picture of what is going on in Austria. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Dear ladies and gentlemen, um, dear colleagues, um, now we are changing uh, the focus a bit, uh, coming from Austria to Germany, where the si situation, I can already promise you, is completely different. And I want to, uh, I'm, my name is Ulf Stein, I'm coming from the Ecologic Institute uh, in Germany, from Berlin, and I want to present you some insights from the German Forum on Fish Protection and Downstream Fish Migration. And the main title uh, of my presentation is How to Improve Fish Protection and Downstream Fish Migration in Rivers, which also was the main topic of the Fish Forum project. Uh, now, just a short overview about uh, what you can expect from my talk. Um, first, I want to start off with what was the motivation, the purpose, and the objectives of the Fish Forum project. Then I want to uh, explain you a bit the structure of this forum, uh, which is quite interesting, I think, because it has a lot of collaborative uh, elements uh, in it. And uh, then I want to go a bit into the technical details, what measures are uh, available for fish protection, and then a short summary and an outlook. So uh, I want to start with the motivation. Um, first of all, <coughs> um, we have a very high implementation pressure in Germany for measures to uh, enhance fish populations. And uh, this implementation pressure is not only coming from the Water Framework Directive, but also from the Habitats Directive or other regulation, for instance, the uh, uh, European uh, EEL regulations. At the same time, uh, from the hydropower side, we have great concerns as these additional measures uh, will have some economic impacts. Uh, and, also, and also, when we started the project, uh, we knew that there are a lot of knowledge gaps be between uh, uh, the relationship of fish populations and, and downstream fish migration. So, um, so, in a way, we could say that the whole discussion about downstream fish migration was characterized by a very tense relationship between all the key st stakeholder groups. And very often, it was not clear, actually, whether those arguments were uh, coming from the technical or uh, uh, political motivation or uh, what motivations are behind uh, these arguments in the discussion. So in a way, we wanted also to achieve a clear table on that. There was a real need uh, for cross-cutting exchange of information and experiences throughout Germany and across sectors. And so the main question that we wanted to answer with the project was, what are the different views of the different stakeholders on the topic? What are the research needs? What is the need for action? And then 
also very important, what are the methods and technologies um, that can be considered as valid and established. So this is now a brief uh, figure uh, about the forum structure. In a way you can uh, understand it as an information platform uh, that consists of a series of events and we started off with a uh, kickoff conference and there was a series of five workshops and we end, end up with a final conference that will take place in November this year. Uh, but not only that, because we know that the discussions will be uh, very tense, we established an advisory board uh, that encompassed all di different uh, actors that are relevant for the topics in Germany and they prepared discussion papers that were the basis for the discussions in the workshops uh, and the uh, results were then laid down uh, in results papers. But uh, even more, we were in a very lucky situation that we had money available to commission research. So um, we uh, commissioned uh, uh, expert study uh, and we asked the uh, consultancy to elaborate on guidelines for site-specific evaluation of fish protection and downstream fish migration measures. And now the interesting thing is that the idea of the study was actually coming from the forum. Now, um, the expert study and the results paper will feed into the final conference uh, and then uh, the results will be summed up in a synthesis report. When I'm always talking about the forum, so, so who, who is active in the forum? First of all, I can say that there was a very high interest in all the events uh, from the forums. We had around 200 very active participants. And um, uh, beyond that, we also had like around 500 followers uh, across sectors. So people were coming from the national authorities uh, namely the river basin, nature conservation, waterway administration from the federal states, the river basin and fishery authorities here. Of course, we also had people uh, taking part of, in our events from the energy sector. We had consultancies, nature and angler NGOs and research institutes and universities. And um, the workshops uh, resulted in uh, results papers and those results papers elaborated on a wide range of aspects that are important if you think about downstream fish migration. We were talking about political and legal aspects, goals for fish protection, behavioral and population biology fundamentals, strategic planning instruments, potential fish harm, technical measures, and last but not least, the functional evaluation of those measures. And uh, I want to give, uh, I want to zoom in in one of those topics uh, uh, and want to explain you a bit more about our results uh, under the category technical measures. <clears throat> so um, as a starting point, we, uh, there was this question, which technology provides adequate fish protection? And uh, if you start thinking uh, about site-specific fish protection, uh, you will very easily come to a conclusion that a complete protection, uh, meaning 100% uh, of all individuals of a population, all life classes of life stages, is currently not achievable. Moreover, high protection rates can be achieved only with impermeable barracks with fine bar spacing. So there was a very uh, uh, on a very tense discussion on, uh, on the different effects of the different measures, but there was one uh, consensus that we could achieve, actually that the state of art knowledge and technology is available for vertical barracks up to 30 cubic meters per second and for horizontal barracks up to 50 cubic meter per second per unit, including cleaning and maintenance. Um, however, the technical feasibilities of barracks, barracks uh, areas at higher discharges, meaning for larger rivers, uh, were discussed very controversially. So, so what then 
to do with locations or in situations uh, where you cannot apply these um, mechanical fish protection measures. And there are four options uh, that the participants highlighted. First of all, you have the options of uh, install uh, fish-friendly turbine management with early warning systems. Although there are still some doubt that these early uh, warning systems are really working as they should. Then another option is that you install fish-friendly turbines. This is already technically possible, but there are still some question marks about the demand investment readiness of those technologies. You can install bypasses and uh, you can ca carry out catch and carry measures, which are already um, implemented for instance, uh, in Germany at the Mosel River for, for ear protection. But this, of course, is only an intermediate solution and in some cases can be only seen as a complementary measure. Now, uh, I want to take a step back and want to give you some uh, conclusions uh, uh, that cover all topics that have been discussed in the FISH Forum. First of all, uh, you can say that the knowledge and the technology for the assessment of upstream fish migration facilities are considerably better than for fish protection measures and downstream fish migration facilities. So that we really see that there are large and uh, intensive uh, uh, discussions uh, needed. We have knowledge gaps and research needs. Knowledge gaps in terms of effective implementation of fish protection and downstream fish migration, especially in large rivers and research needs in terms of behavioral and population biology. And this especially applies to Potamodromus species. So if you have knowledge gaps, uh, so what can you do? And uh, this was also uh, discussed very controversially in the forum. Um, some people were saying, well, we need a moratorium uh, for the construction of new plants and barriers. Other people were saying, well, uh, actually, we need a moratorium for uh, new environmental regulations because we don't have state-of-the-art technology ready, ready, especially for the large rivers. And we were uh, very happy that in the course of the discussion we could find some, let's say, common uh, understanding of uh, how we want to um, deal with those knowledge gaps. And uh, the solution here is actually twofolded. First of all, we need implementation of measures, so action is really recommended, recommended. And we need to use existing knowledge and available technologies, even if no certainties of the sufficient performance exist. At the same time, we need to realize clear contractual rules and procedures for administration, but also for measure contractors. On the other side, in parallel to the measure implementation, we need to improve and collect knowledge. So we need those performance evaluations uh, and evaluate existing plans. And um, that is, uh, we are now in this happy situation because uh, we commissioned those guidelines that I mentioned before on functional evaluation. We can use now these me methods actually uh, to evaluate existing plans and I, I hope that these guidelines will be of great help in the practice. So more research is needed, and not only laboratory research, but also field research. We need more pilot facilities, experiments, and models. And those conclusions are now feed into our final conference, which will take place uh, on 27th November this year in Germany, in Bonn, in the Federal Ministry uh, for the Environment, and um, actually, I want to take the opportunity here to invite every one of you who is interesting, in, interested in the topic uh, to come there. We still have some places uh, available, uh, and we are also very interested uh, uh, to, to exchange uh, uh, insights, uh, especially with our German-speaking neighboring countries. I also want to say that all the information in uh, much more detail is laid down at our website, www.forum slash There you find the, all the results papers and the final synthesis report. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And now I'll be happy to answer the question you may have. Thank you. 
I think after we heard uh, Veronika koller kreimel from Austria and Ulf from Germany, I'm a good mixture. I was born and raised in Germany, but for the last 26 years I've been living in Vienna. Uh, my name is Ulrich Eichelmann. Um, I've spent my entire professional life on protecting on rivers, basically in NGOs. I worked, for example, 17 years for WWF as a freshwater officer. Then I fought six years against the dam on the Tigris, Eliso in Turkey. And now I've been working on the protection of the rivers on the Balkan Peninsula. We see a little bit of a film later in the afternoon. But this, what I'm going to show you here, is actually from my hometown. That's the river I was born and raised. It's called the Altenau. And that is, to my understanding, the best restoration story in Europe. Not in Europe, but in Germany. Um, maybe in Europe, too. It's a unique story. And it's, uh, it's actually a real practical example how things can go on. Um, the whole thing is, what you see here is that the, the river is, is, is situated in North Rhine-Westphalia, that's the red one, and it's near, you know, that's not big cities, it's uh, Paderborn, you know, probably the ones who are interested in football, they're in the first league, Paderborn. Um, and there's the Altenau. The Altenau is a river uh, that eventually runs into the Rhine, it's 28 kilometers long, was a normal one with trout species, you know, with kingfishers, this kind of, kind of uh, hilly type of river. And that's what the river looks like now in the upper part, where it's very nice. But the majority of the river looks like that. That's an ordinary picture, you know, it could be everywhere, anywhere in Europe, actually. Regulated, the banks are fixed, river's running fast. This is the uh, picture from 1964 from my hometown. The, the town is 1,000 in heaven, so very small. That was the Altenau in 1964, up to 40 meters wide with gravel banks, and you know the people were taking the gravel to construct things. The good old days. The meadows were like this. Uh, this is uh, in, in Latin, Cadamine pratensis, you know, the flowers that, that live in the swampy meadows. But exactly this place is looking like this today. So they build a reservoir in order for plaque protection, and there is a stable reservoir for tourism, not, not for producing electricity. That's too small, probably. And the reason why we started that restoration project started all in July 6, 1965. And, and I tried to give you an overview. This is a German... Uh, television report, but I, I tell you later the ones who are not understanding this. Oh no, it doesn't work. Okay, uh, that's bad luck. Nevertheless, then uh, we continue. Make it. So then I'll tell you in quick words. It started in 1965 in July. We had a huge flood in the valley where seven people died. And after that, they decided to regulate the whole river on the 28 kilometer and to build flood protection reservoirs all along the river. The result was this, what you see. They regulated the river so much that they killed it in my, my hometown. So the river was not flowing anymore during the summer period because the, the upper dams were built in the karstic region. So 80% of the water that went into the reservoir went down into the ground. But people, I was living in, in Vienna already by that day, people didn't understand what is happening. Suddenly, for thousands of years, the water was flowing and suddenly was disappeared. We had the geese and the ducks, they were standing in the dry riverbed, which you would have seen in the film. So we were, th we were thinking, what is it? And I went back home, and this is one of the very upper reservoirs. It's not only hold holding back the water, but it's decreasing the, the, uh, the water quality. The reservoir is increasing the water temperature downstream when it is flowing by six degrees. When you know about fish, that means a lot. That's the end of, of, of brown trout in our area. And, uh, you know, the, we are full of algae in the river downstream. And the riverbed incision, the erosion was extremely, after these regulations and after the dam procedure uh, buildings, uh, this tree species, or the man, what he's doing was the original in the, in the 70s, actually, the river uh, level of the river, and now it's gone down. And when we started in 19... That, that was me, actually, in 1991, up there. Uh, we started to oppose this. We said in 1991, what the heck, you know, we, we want our river back. What is going on? And we started the idea of bringing down the dams, two dams. They were constructed five years earlier, and we said they have to go. 
that was incredible for the most of the people because they thought this is a big achievement, big dams. Uh, and we started to do that. And, and because the river was gone, people were affected that would never be, have been interested in a river before. These are ordinary farmers, local people, who were protesting in front of the politician area of the Rathaus, municipality, and they said, our alt now is dying, uh, we want a river instead of dams. And that was five years after construction. And then we did postcard thing, all kinds what you can do, and which were people in my area, in the countryside, were not used to. We made a postcard that the Alt now shall live with all the typical species that were used to be in that river. We invited minister from Northern Westphalia to, to come and to release some fish when the Alt now was flowing. And then in 2001, we did something that changed the whole thing. Before, we were fighting against the, gover the government, saying we want our river back, we want restoration, we want to tear down the dams. And the, everybody said, no, that's impossible. You know, that's, you know, the landowners won't accept this. What we did is we did a, a memorandum, the Alt now shall live. And the, the subtitle is, a valley wants its river back. And all the mayors of the villages along this river signed this petition. And that went to the government in North Rhine-Westphalia. And in those days, there was a green environmental minister, Babel Hoon. And she was so pleased that, sudden, that it went, came from, this, from the bottom, from the people that asking for restoring a river. That's exactly what the Water Framework Directive is actually aiming for. And then she sent her best people and they said, you don't worry about money. We give you all the money that you want, but you have to you know, give us the space and you have to work with us. And then it started. And when we made one restoration project after the other, we bought the land, and this would have been the next film where you see what we're doing. Um, so there is no, but this is politicians, you know, we have produced cakes with the Altenau that you could eat. Um, kids were involved. And that's what, what, what we actually did. This was, this was the original canal of the Altenau, and it turned out it was too destroyed already. You, it was so channelized and so deep inside, you cannot just open the, bra the side and, and get rid of the fixed banks. You have to block the channel, and we, we did with a caterpillar, I think there's somewhere over there, we, we, we constructed a, an ex you know, a, 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 a flow, a riverbed, and then let it go. And that, you know, let it develop as it wants to. So that's look what it looks like uh, when it was released, when it was opened, the, one of the sections. And this is one year later, and that's three years later, the same area. So very dynamic, riverbed erosion, side erosion came back. You know, we need the gravel, you know, like we need to gravel in order to bring the riverbed up again. And this was all four meters wide at the beginning, and now it's, it's uh, step by step, the alt now is coming back. You know, the usual, usual things that people are exploring the river again. My father learned to swim in that river. And I learned in the 70s to catch trout with your bare hands in that river. And then, you know, we're trying to bring it back. The whole... So the, these, this is our, um, what's called, grayling? grayling. They're, they're slowly recovering. And this um, dragonflies. The black stork is extremely growing the population in the valley. Actually, they're getting more and more like the white stork. They're in the villages now. They breed close to the villages and they're not afraid anymore. The kingfisher population is coming back slowly. This one is not. This is a dipper, or a typical species, bird species of the Alta now. It's not coming back at the moment, as well as the trout. And the reason is, and as this one as well, the reason is the dam, the dam upstream, because the water is still too warm. But up to now, I show you something, what we have achieved so far. We have, a, you know, we stored 29 hectares and there's 50 more to come. Uh, we, we, we depleted 48 wires and obstacles. And 20 kilometers are accessible. That is the best since the Middle Ages because we had all the mills uh, in, in the Alta now. And so the graylings, for example, can migrate up to my village but not across the bigger dams. And that's so still eight kilometers of the Alt now and, and almost 15 kilometers of tributaries are still blocked, but this is the reason why. Nobody can cover that one, can cross that one. But we, this came down um, in September. You know, it was dried out. 
and then it will, you know, it won't, it will be, there will be um, um, the potential of restoring floods, holding back the floods, but the Altno will go through. There will be no reservoir lake anymore. And that's what it looks like right after the water came down. And the second dam, which is really a dam that will be torn down in spring this year. That happens. The Alte now in 28 kilometers for the first time since the Middle Ages will be in, a, in an excellent state. State. You know, it will be a good status, actually. So there is, this is what it looks like um, before. Most of the time, my hometown, no water. This is what we, we hope to achieve. And the lessons learned is they built the dams in 1984 and they bring them down 2014. There is no way you can achieve these things without several people. All these stories start with single people, with single persons. They go for it. They never give up. You need a long breath. You need to think big. Think the unthinkable. Imagine, in 1991, we, we said well, the dams have to go. And we created more and more momentum. And eventually, they come down. But it needs a long time. For my expectation, too much. It's a generation and lifetime. So, ma so many kids were born in that period. So many people died during that people fighting for the dams. And kids who grow up have never seen the Altenau flowing all year round. When they're there, they, for them it's completely normal that the Altenau is dry. So we had to fight against the timing because we need the support of those people. But nevertheless, we were um, successful. And in this respect, I think this is completely um, unique that the people fought for the river for such a long period and achieved all the things that you hear in lots of these workshops today and yesterday and before in theory, in theory. And this is a practical example, um, which is, is extremely valuable in my eyes and needs to be promoted. And when the last dam comes down in spring, we make a huge festival. We make a huge festival and we're trying to communicate that all over the world that this is happening. It's de-damming. It it's, it's in, includes a de-damming. So the, in this, it's the last slide, actually, we, the slogan says, the, the Altnau shall live a valley once at river back, and the Altnau is back, actually. And uh, that's us. And that's where you find new information. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Konrad Gorski from the University of Concepcion. And, um, and if I come back to, to, to words just said just a moment ago, that the situation in Germany was completely different than the situation in Austria. I want to show you something completely different. Um, I want to take you to the southern hemisphere and I want to talk about the migration of fish there. Uh, this talk is also not directly uh, about restoration, but uh, the, 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 the information that, that is gained here is used in restoration, restoration already, so that's very good. Um, so where are we? The southern hemisphere. We have more water there, less land than, than here in the northern hemisphere. We have all sorts of range of rivers also there. Um, from, uh, um, um, from rivers highly degraded and uh, with, with high anthropogenic pressure in Australia and New Zealand, for example, uh, these pressures are due to land use change and, and, and hydropower construction, similar to, to the situation in Europe. And um, in, 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 in southern part of South America, the other part I want to talk to you about, uh, the situation is we have m much more, uh, more pristine rivers there. But these ones are also uh, uh, under high upcoming pressure, the, the electricity demand in that part of the world is uh, growing very rapidly and thousands of new hydropower dams are, are projected within the uh, coming decade. Uh, the, the, the fish that live there, we have different species. Uh, uh, the, the most widespread and, and dominating are galaxies, small-bodied. Uh, usually migratory fish. We have a, a couple of lamprey species. Uh, we have eels in, um, in Australia and New Zealand, two species of eels, and these are the only ones that are large-bodied in that part. The, the Anguilla di Fenbachi, the New Zealand eel, uh, uh, can grow up to three, four meters. They are pretty huge. 
And then we have the introduced species, commonly spread, uh, the biggest issues and, and uh, are with, with carps. Carps are everywhere in high abundances, causing a lot of problems. And then we have the contradictory ones, which are the salmonids, uh, brown trout, rainbow trout, and salmons, such as coho or chinook salmons. These, on one hand, are important economically because they are, um, they are sources of uh, recreational fisheries. And on the other hand, they are very often very deteriorating for the native fish fauna and native ecosystems. So in, 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 the, in the recent decades, we, sh we saw the declining uh, native populations in, 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 the, in the southern rivers. Here the example of important for traditional fisheries, um, uh, Galaxia maculatus catches in, in one of the rivers in New Zealand. Within the last uh, uh, 60, 70 years, the catch has dropped uh, about tenfold. So the societies are urged to, uh, to, to, to preserve, to sustainably manage native fish and fisheries, to, 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 to protect them. But very often, uh, the, the, the life histories, um, and the biology of these fish is, not, is poorly understood. So what the, the things I would like, uh, would like to talk to you was, was, are the recent studies that we have been doing to fill in some of these gaps to facilitate management and restoration of, of some of these species. And I divided this talk in two different parts. First, I will talk about in details about migration and habitat use of, uh, of, of this particular species, the one that is commercially important and traditionally important um, in two uh, rivers, one in, in Chile, Valdivia River, and one in New Zealand, the Waikato River. And then I will explore a bit more in detail uh, a latitudinal difference in migration strategies of this species um, uh, in, in Chilean rivers. Um, two rivers, Waikato and Valdivia, around 38 south latitude, similar size, similar latitude, similar characteristics. Um, oh, there's some surprises. Um, similar flow pattern, a little bit more water in, in the Valdivia, but uh, low, uh, low flow in summer, high flows in winter and spring in both rivers. The, 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 the Valdivia Basin is a bit more complex. There are large headwater lakes. Here we have one big lake in the Waikato in New Zealand. Um, and there is a big difference in human pressure between these two rivers. On one hand, in the Waikato in New Zealand, we have five hydrodumps, the, the red ones here, and the lower river was uh, highly changed uh, in terms of land use. The, the native vegetation was converted to pastures, around 90% of the floodplains gone, disconnected, and, and, and we have uh, the highest milk production in the world there. In the Valdivia, the pressure is different. There is one dam being constructed at the moment. Uh, further ones are planned. And there are some changes in land use, uh, but mostly to, uh, for forestry. There's not that much pasture there. There are some. So if we look at the lateral migration of, uh, of fish in the few remaining flat plain bits with native vegetation here, uh, Te Kauka, Kekatea Forest, very beautiful in New Zealand. We, we, we used directional fike nets to look at the, at the migration into the floodplain in relation to inundation patterns. We saw that indeed many native fish species used the floodplain during inundation. Here we have the eels uh, during high flows migrating into the floodplain. Around 10 eels per hour we were catching uh, in, in these nets. Also other, like the galaxids, um, uh, were in, in lower numbers, were also entering into the floodplain. But what we also saw with the outflowing water, with the retreating water after spring inundation, we saw uh, very high numbers of juvenile larvae carps, so invasive carps, 
floating out of the floodplain. Similar situation in, uh, in the Valdivia, in, uh, in Chile. Also, many native fish species use the floodplain. High numbers in both flooded forest and pasture. The native forest used much more frequently than the pasture, especially during the day, and by uh, adult individuals. Um, uh, we have two different galaxies here, uh, most abundant. And at night, also many juvenile galaxies. Uh, um, and some uh, predatory native perch uh, occupying habitats, uh, flooded habitats uh, within the floodplain. Now, in we, we uh, so that was the lateral part, and it seems that yes, they are important for native fish. Also, then we looked at the longitudinal habitats within these two rivers, also by by the abundant and important species, Galaxias maculatus, and we did this looking at the microchemistry of their ear bones or otholiths. These are known to reflect the chemistry of the water masses experienced by, uh, by fish in its lifespan. So, uh, and we know the, the chemical differences between marine and freshwater, so we expect high strontium concentrations in parts of, of the bone that grew in, uh, when, when fish was living in marine environment and, um, and low when it was living in freshwater and the opposite for barium. We compared these life history strategies of, of this particular species caught in lower parts of, of these two rivers. And similar rivers, same species, but they do very different things. Majority of the fish, all of the fish in the Waikato River uh, are diadromos. They spend the larva stage in, in the ocean uh, as, as, as indicated by high strontium var uh, values in the core region, the larva region of the ear bone. Whereas in, in the Valdivia, in, um, in Chile, all the fish recruited uh, were born and spent all their life in freshwater, all the fish that we analyzed. Um, and then um, let's look at, uh, in a bit more detail in, in, in other Chilean rivers, same species. And here we looked at the differences in this marine freshwater continuum habitat use across latitudes, across different climates, um, wh whether there were, uh, there were any uh, differences. Chile is a perfect place to do that. It offers a gradient of temperatures and flows. The rivers have um, have unique distributions from north to south because of the Andes range um, in the eastern side. Twelve rivers from 36 uh, south to 48 south. Um, most of them large rivers. Some, some, of the, some of the basins more complex with large headwater lakes uh, like, like the Valdivia we saw in, in more detail just before. Some of them a bit smaller. Um, most of them uh, highly pristine, especially the ones in the south. In the, the, the northern ones, Bioio is, is, is highly used. There is a, a million people city there. Um, so in each of, this, uh, in each of, of, of these rivers, we, 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 we conducted fish surveys. We collected uh, fish in different parts of the river. In, um, in, in headwater lakes, in, in upstream, uh, downstream, and the, in the estuaries. And we looked at the abundances, but we also did, uh, we also analyzed uh, stable isotopes uh, composition to look at, the, at uh, to, to get some insights into the habitat use by them. If we compare the temperature and the flow of, the, of these different rivers, temperature in the red and flow uh, or discharge in, uh, in the blue here, we see that in the northern rivers, the, it's warm, uh, the, the summer temperatures above 15, winter 10. There is, there is high number of degree days above 12 degrees, uh, 150 to 180 in, in these five. And there is a strong seasonal pattern of discharge of flow with high flows in winter and spring. And, and these inundate floodplains. And then we have low flows in summer. The intermediate ones, we have um, a bit colder, 14 summer, 6 in winter, 110 
or above 12 in a year, and the seasonality is less visible here. There's more variability in, in, the, in the flows. Down south, much colder, third in summer, two in winter, below 90 degree days in, in a year. Uh, very variable flows in these two, in the, in the big one in the south. There is seasonality of the flows, but it's, it, it is the opposite of the one that we observe in the north. We have high flows in the summer due to uh, melting of the, of the glaciers. So if we look at the abundance of the fish in, this, in these different rivers of this particular species, we see that in the northern rivers, uh, the highest abundances of fish are observed in the, in, the, in the river channel. Then in the southern rivers, the fish were absent usually in the channels. We did not, uh, they, they are not present there, except for the Puello River in the, in the lower part, which is in the intermediate kind of. And then we always uh, collected fish in the estuaries, and, and, and in the lakes where they were present, we observed intermediate uh, abundances. And, it, and the abundances in the estuaries were also lower to the ones in the river main channel. Now we look at the stable isotope composition. Uh, we expect uh, the, the values of both C30, Delta C34 and uh, N15 to be depleted in the freshwater ecosystems. So the higher values of these deltas suggest marine contact for this fish. So all the fish in, in estuaries show marine signatures. In lake populations, uh, the, uh, the, the sulfur and nitrogen values were, were depleted. Now, the, 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 the river populations in, in, in the northern, smaller and without headwater lakes, uh, show uh, um, some signals of marine recruitment also in the, in the middle part of the river and the lower uh, Puello River in the intermediate part also uh, 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 the fish there were characterized by marine recruitment. And then in the large northern basins, uh, the, the, the river Rhine populations of the middle part of the rivers, they were freshwater recruited. So to summarize uh, these findings, um, uh, the lateral habitats are of high importance for nat native fish in, in, in these southern hemisphere rivers. Only rivers at the, at, the, at the lower latitudes and those with predictable flow patterns, so we've had water lakes, had more non-migratory fish. So the manage management strategies that promote uh, um, connectivity are essential uh, to, to, to maximize the habitat availability for these um, native, uh, native fish. Now, one of the, uh, one of the, one of the big things from management issues that is coming up usually and with, 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 with both flat plane restoration and longitudinal uh, um, connectivity due to hydropowers are the invasive fish which uh, have very deteriorating effect on ecosystems there. And the, the two big ones are, uh, are carp. Um, and carp um, proliferates very rapidly. It deteriorates the habitat. It, um, it, 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 um, it has a very negative impact on native uh, fish and invertebrate community too. And the other ones are salmonids, also very it, these are difficult ones because on one hand, we like salmonids because we can fish them, but on the other hand, they have a very deteriorating effect, especially in the southern Patagonia, where already in many places, exclusive distributions are observed. So where the salmonids colonized or where they were introduced, the galaxies are literally disappearing. So the, this, this is a very big issue there. There, there are some uh, uh, potential options, flat plain restoration projects in New Zealand, for example, now uh, with, the, with the connecting channels, which can be used as bottlenecks. We can use some exclusion nets and, and things like this. Um, this. We can do this because of the, of the size difference in fish. Native fish are usually small. Similar thing with the fish pass design. We are working now on the fish pass designs because there are thousands of hydro dams 
projected in Chile for coming uh, coming years. And and well, the majority of the designs that exist in the world were produced in the northern hemisphere, where we care about salmonids and we want to uh, we, we we want to uh, we want them to be happy and we want to, uh, them to migrate, which very often uh, will not be suitable for the for the native fauna there because the fish are small and so we don't want the salmonids to use the fish pass actually we want them to stay where they are um, there so that's um, yeah the difficult thing yeah thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, your patience to listen to one more presentation today. Uh, we have a very long title, but uh, actually we would like to present to you a pilot case study that we executed uh, and uh, we used the habitat modeling approach for the uh, determination of habitat suitability for the brown trout. This is the species on the picture. Uh, we were working together with uh, civil engineers, uh, hydraulic specialists, from uh, one of them from Institute for Water of the Republic of Slovenia is here present today, and uh, the others were biologists from the Fisheries Research Institute of Slovenia. I think I'm the fourth one on the list. So, uh, what was the background for the starting of this project? Uh, we decided that uh, we recognize some problems that we have in Slovenia with the different types of water use. Uh, and in last five years, we somehow managed to implement the uh, ecologically acceptable flow into our um, legislation. But we still have pro problems with calculation of this environmentally acceptable flow because, because it's based mo mostly on hydraulic parameters. Uh, so we did that uh, research project that was financed by the Ministry of Environment from Slovenia and research agency. Um, and here is what we did. Uh, we chose the, the small river called Radona. It is an alpine river uh, with snow rain regime. And uh, its length is 30 kilometers and catchment area of, of 140 square kilom kilometers. The mean annual flow of this river is uh, approximately 8 cubic meter, meters per second. Uh, so this is the location. Radona River is a tributary of the Sava River, uh, just on the border with Austria. Uh, we selected four dif different uh, sections of the river. Uh, two of them were without water abstractions and two of them were under the influence of uh, water abstraction for the use in hyd small hydropower plants. Uh, Rad Raduna River is uh, uh, otherwise uh, not regulated. It's a natural river, very attractive for uh, tourists and uh, fly fishers and other uh, then we decided to use the uh, computer model called Casimir. The model was developed by the University of Stuttgart uh, experts um, and it is based on the fuzzy logic rules. Uh, we, need to, we always need to prepare some input data. If you want to do habitat modeling, you need water depths, you need uh, flow velocities and substrate types. Uh, then you set your fuzzy rules. This is an example. If the water is de uh, its depth is high and the flow velocity is medium and the substrate, uh, substrate size is high, then the habitat suitability, for example, for the brown tri trout is high. Uh, as the final result of the habitat <coughs> model is a graphical and a numerical presentation of habitat suitability for a fish species. We decided for the brown trout because it's very common fish species in Slovenia. Its, uh, uh, distri uh, its distribution is in almost all an alpine uh, cold water rivers. And in Radona River, a brown trout is the only species. It has self-sustainable population. Uh, that's how we excluded the predator moment for the preferences to the habitat. Uh, one of the important uh, phases of the habitat modeling is the determination of fuzzy sets. 
This is just a graphical presentation of those fuzzy sets that we use for our brown trouts in Radona. We determined the substrate, substrate type, type preferences, uh, water depth for the brown trout, uh, flow velocities, and uh, then the habitat suitability index. This is the data set that you need to put into the habitat model. Uh, this is just a short uh, uh, overall calibration scheme. Uh, what you need to, do, to know is that for every uh, uh, fuzzy sets and rules have to be calibrated and then verificated and then validated. Uh, for all of this, we used the results of our habitat model and compared them to the actual field me measurements. Uh, the scheme is also on our poster in the main hall. Uh, the hardest part of the project was the data acquisition. We had to do a lot of it. We had to do it with uh, many different uh, methods. Uh, so for the hydraulic model, which, which has to be done before you start habitat modeling, we did a geodetic survey, uh, bathymetric survey, water depths, and uh, uh, then we measured discharge and water velocities. And then our colleague, Sasha, who is a hydraulic engineer, did the hydraulic modeling with the use of the CCHE software. This is a, a short look to the results of the hydraulic uh, model. It shows water depths and uh, water velocities. And these are the actual results of hydraulics on one of the chosen four sections of our river. Uh, other people were into determination of uh, every other uh, hydromorphological, more morphological parameters. We decided to determine different types of the substrate. We actually measured every bigger structure in the riverbed, boulders, undercut banks, uh, rocks, stones, uh, small sediment and we used uh, a scale of uh, f different fractions of substrate uh, for further work. Uh, for the fish, especially for the brown trout, it is very important that they have uh, fish covers. Uh, the fish should always, uh, wants always to avoid predators, uh, so we also determined and identified different types of fish covers in Radona River. Uh, as I showed you and it is seen on the pictures we saw uh, we determined undercut uh, banks and uh, wood roots, dead wood, wet branches, rocks and stones and also turbulence because fish can uh, hide into turbid water. This is a, a graphical presentation of, uh, of our determination of substrate. Uh, this map we also used in the field as a protocol wh where we put on the, the fish data when we were working. This is the substrate types. You can see there's a lot of diversity of different substrates. And uh, this is the, here are the fish covers. Uh, one of the methods that we used for the fish because we needed a lot of fish data was also visual census method. Uh, it's not inv a non-invasive method where, when, where you observe fish in the water from the riverbank uh, the first phase was actually the monitoring of the fish in the river, but because the fish moves and you don't know how large the fish is, uh, we calibrated uh, it, its length and position <coughs> later with the different uh, length models of the fish. The second method that we used for fish sampling wa was modified electrofishing method. We used uh, gas power to back pack uh, generators, uh, two of them in the stream, and while two electrofishers were uh, fishing uh, in front, uh, other ones were actually, actually putting all the data of the location of the fish that was found in the river. So you had to mark the location, the ex as much as possible, exact location of the fish where it came from, because this was the basic for determination of uh, preferences of the fish for a certain habitat. So it was uh, a lot of work uh, in a micro scale. 
and this is how it looked when we gathered all the data. This is the substrate and fish cover data, which we joined with the fish data. All of those fish were sampled in only uh, one sampling. Uh, we, we had four different samplings in four seasons of the year uh, on all four of the chosen sections. Here you can see different uh, fish location, different uh, in distribution and different fish size. Uh, if you took a closer look, you could see that uh, under those undercut banks, there were more small fish than elsewhere in the stream. Uh, because we needed to determine the preferences of young fish, of juvenile fish and adult fish, we needed somehow to, to get the information of the fish age. The problem is that the Raduna River is very cold, so it has approximately 8 to 10 degrees over all the year, and fish in Raduna grow very slow, and you cannot determine how old it is or if it's uh, already sexually mature, mature. So we determined uh, the maturity with sampling in the spawning season. We sampled some fish, not too many, and then we did the section of specimen uh, to determine the ovary uh, and the testicle maturity. And we also took uh, fish scales and we were determining the fish age with the fish scale examination. Uh, this is just a short overview of uh, age and gender structure of the brown trout in Raduna. Here we have the graphic demonstration of length and age correlation. You can see that not so old fish are still very small, but uh, we found out that it, with the length of uh, 15 centimeters, uh, more than half of the fish are already adult. Uh, when we had all those data, we put them into the habitat model uh, and then we were modeling. We were changing the discharge. Uh, as a result, we got the graphic the demonstration of uh, suitability index. Those are habitats. Green color is uh, <laughs> good habitat for small fish. This is uh, modeling for juvenile brown trouts and uh, red color is uh, the part of the river that is, that is not so suitable for the juvenile brown trouts. Now we will go through this. You can see the colors change. This is how the habitat model works. And you can already see that the mainstream of the river is not very good for the young fish, for the small fish. Uh, we wanted to put this uh, into practical use, so for the planning of further habitat improvement where you have no influence on uh, the quantity of water withdrawal because someone already has its license, uh, there are al always some other mitigation rules, uh, measures that you can implement. Uh, uh, this was uh, just a theoretical application of uh, two <coughs> low bottom weirs that we could put in Raduna section where, already, uh, where uh, water use for small hydropower plant is already exi existing. Uh, here you can see water depths. Uh, the dark blue is deeper, the light blue are more shallow. Uh, before <coughs> hydraulic modeling, uh, uh, this is the state before hydraulic modeling. This is theoretical state of water depth after the implementation of two low bottom weirs. I hope you can see that here is a, a small pool, uh, two of them formed, and uh, they don't have uh, any other, uh, there, there's not any other bigger change in the river hydro hydrology, but you can see and recognize that uh, we can easily get uh, deeper water for the fish if we put some structures in the stream. Uh, the habitat model also showed that uh, there's a significant uh, change in the uh, user weighted usable area for the fish in this section. The connected line is uh, for the before. This, here are young fish, ju juvenile fish, here are adult fish, and the, this line shows the change of the usable area for the fish after the theoretical uh, implementation of low bottom weirs in the section. 
So you can see that fish could actually have more of the surface, more of the habit habitat uh, that could use if you put some mitigation measures that you planned. So here are the conclusions we learned a lot. We implemented different knowledge and uh, different uh, methods of sampling. Uh, we used the Casimir uh, software. We used the, the modern approach to habitat modeling. Uh, that we calibrated and validated and uh, we actually used the field data to do the fine tuning of the fuzzy sets so we could get some uh, real model output for the Slovenian brow trout population in this region. Uh, the project was interdisciplinary, uh, it lasted for two years, we finished it uh, in September last year uh, they gave us all together about, uh, I think it was 100,000 uh, euros for two different in institutions. Uh, we are now trying to put this uh, approach with habitat modeling to a higher level. Uh, we are moving from the smaller river, uh, Raduna, to the Sava River and we, we are also changing the fish species. We will now try to do the habitat modeling for the uh, Danube salmon, Kuho Kuho, and uh, we will see how far we get. So, thank you for your attention. Yes, it's going to be about spawning channels for fish reproduction and landscape. So, something of, of, <clears throat> of my, my background, I come from Finnish Environment Institute and I'm landscape architect, so I'm not a fish specialist or you know, engineer, but I'm dealing with this, these issues. <coughs> <coughs> the contents <coughs> will be how to ensure all ecosystem services in modified rivers, or anyway, how to try to ensure them. And, <coughs> and the, there's a common interest for reviving migratory fish despite hydropower in Europe and in Finland, in a, in a northern area. Uh, then there I, will, uh, I will show some good examples from Canada and Europe, anyway, what I think are, are best, best practice. And then about uh, flowing water as landscape feature, how can we enhance it or save it? And then I have one example from Finland that's under construction actually now. So we have already have had this question about hydropower and the <clears throat> this big interest. And during the conference, we have heard of the of the plans actually all over the world of increasing hydropower. <clears throat> so we can talk about the boom of hydropower construction. And which is actually rather threatening, thinking about the values of of rivers in the world. And the, the, in the political argumentation, it's always uh, uh, talk about adjustability of water power through regulation of waters. So that's why it is considered to be good renewable energy. And then there is a, there's a big need for defining environmental flows for fishery and other uses. And this is a question how far we can save, safeguard the species and landscape through environmental flow issues and defining them to the permits. And then I'm going to talk about these compensative measures to safeguard the processes of ecosystems and how far it could be possible. Here are here is uh, shown here are shown what the use is. So hydropower is one of them, and the, 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 some aspects of our environmental flows or natural flows, because these natural flows in the rivers they contribute to ecology, also landscape, fishery, and for recreation and tourism, which are affiliated quite a lot for ecology and also fishery, for instance. And, of course, in the world, especially on the dry areas, this uh, dilution and natural purification of, of these waters coming from industry and communi communities, it's an important thing about environmental flows. So 
this environmental flows, if they are defined, thinking about these minimum flows in the different seasons, they contribute to these ecosystem services. And that's our question, how far we can, we can provide these other ecosystem services as uh, when they are at the same time are these water uses like hydropower. <clears throat> this is a situation in the Baltic Sea re region. Uh, you see the map of Finland to the right. There, there are these um, yellow rivers marked. Most of the rivers in Finland are, uh, are heavily modified and we have actually lost the salmon stocks of almost all rivers. Because we had had the policy of not having fish passes after the Second World War, but just make, uh, having artificial hatching and stocking of salmons. But nowadays, the fish researchers have noticed that the salmon, actually, they don't come back. So it's a waste of money having this stocking policy and that's why there's a common agreement in Finland now that also by the power companies that we have changed the policy totally for natural reproduction. And we have also the national fish pass strategy in Finland. It's, it's two years old now. And it's also linked for the implementation of water framework directive and the continuity issues. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm stressing here that it says in Water Framework Directive that all feasible methods should be applied, thinking about migration, but also spawning and reproduction of species. It is very clearly said, said there that also other methods must be considered, not only to have any kind of fish pass for migration. My question is now, is it possible to compensate the ancient reproduction amounts of juveniles of salmon and trout in the rivers which are heavily modified? This is a question. Here are some measures what could be applied. We're thinking about mitigation or compensation of, the, of this, the state of these heavily modified rivers. So I'm, have, I have marked here with blue the things that I think that are, could mean some kind of compensation of the losses. So if we construct a fish pass, say about like a technical fish pass, I think that as you said that we cannot, any, any fish pass cannot actually compensate the loss of habitats. And uh, oh, there are always difficulties with fish passes in the functioning but if we, if we construct a technical fish pass, we can some, in some extent we can, we can make, make some mitigation for the loss of connectivity. But then there are other possibilities like nature-like bypass channels also with habitats. So there are possibilities for weak swimming, swimming fishes to migrate. But then <clears throat> the next stage would be constructing new compensative side channels they can be a part of a bypass channel for migration, but they can be also separately constructed for, especially for spawning and rearing uh, purposes of fish. Of course, we, we need to restore uh, dry rapids uh, with environmental flows in the sections that, have, that have, are dry nowadays with <clears throat> because of permits without any or or sufficient envir environmental or minimum flow requirements. So all these mitigation measures should be combined and then we could uh, ask if we can compensate the loss of the or original reproduction. There are some examples that I show here now, <clears throat> first from Europe. These are two, uh, two reproduction channels that are specially constructed in connection with hydropower <clears throat> Some of you might know them. <clears throat> <clears throat> so the, to the left there's one in the Rhine River, Rheinfelden, it's rather new one, two, two years old. You can see the power plant back there and this is a compensative reproduction channel. It's called really 
spawning channel in German language. Uh, it is 900 meters long, about 50 meters broad, and it uh, has rather a big discharge, 10 cubic meters, so it's quite a river actually, 10 to even to 35 cubic meters for flushing purposes. And, an, and another example, a smaller one in Ruppoldingen in Aare River, this same kind of reproduction channel, but is connected with the river also with fish pass. So the fish, the fish can find these reproduction channels through a fish pass because the entrance of this is not located in a, in the right place in that sense that they they would be under the obstacle. And there were there was this example from Reinfeld and that. Some months after the opening, already someone found it, even if there are not fish passes between Basel and Strasbourg. So they're just under, under planning there. But probably they got there through fish loses. Then I, I will show you some examples from Canada, because there's been a long history of compensation channels already in Canada, they call them, they have, first they call them uh, spawning channels, then also as rearing channels or constructed side channels. And this is an example from Newfoundland. It's called really Compensation Creek. Um, both of these lakes, upstream and downstream, they are regulated. And there's a power plant and for compensation of the loss of the habitats for Atlantic salmon in this case, or a landlock form of Atlantic salmon, this uh, compensation, compensation creek was constructed. It's 1.6 kilometers long, and there's some evidence that the salmon really uses it also. I don't have the data of how much production of juveniles it can produce, but anyway, there's this long tradition of invest for such kind of compensation measures in Canada. Some, one, one other example from Canada to the left, they were, these measures were began in the Pacific coast, in the, in the west coast near Vancouver, like Fraser River catchment. There are many of such kind of spawning channels, like for, for red salmon, Weaver Creek in this case. They are also used for uh, as touristic attractions because on the spawning time, a lot of people can they like to go there to see these these ch spawning channels. And then uh, about fish passes, there's there's one example from Finland, which is also uh, it's a nature-like fish pass, which is now a touristic act attraction. So I think it's very good to combine the interest of, of fish migration and fish reproduction and also that people can see these, these areas. Uh, another example from Canada, there's a nature-like channel, it's totally constructed, but the fish are using it. In this, in this case, humpback salmons are there, also silver salmons. And you can see the juvenile production in, the, in this case, so it really functions also. Then I'll come to this example in Finland. We have one of the biggest rapids in Europe that was actually spoiled because of power plant, plant construction. You can see the dam there behind and the people uh, watching the rapid on a, on a bridge because there are shows only for 15 minutes every day in the summertime at six o'clock. So you can go there and see this rapid, ancient rapids. So it's really gone. And to the right, you can see how it's, how it's normally. It's totally dry. And there are tourists, especially from Russia, coming there to these shows. And there's music under these 15 minutes shows and so on. So this is what is one form of environmental flow, but it's, I would call it landscape or show flow, or something like that. Now there's ongoing this project where I have been also, which I have also been planning. 
Uh, now it's this, uh, there's an idea to have, uh, have a new urban brook in this area. And this area still, even if there's no water normally in this rapid, so it's uh, designated as a national, national landscape in Finland. And there was this uh, task for this planning was to create a, some kind of a compensative uh, habitat because there, there's, there are local droughts living in the small brooks in this area. And also the power company gave just a little amount of water, only 300 liters per second, second in summertime and 150 liters in the wintertime. And our planning task was to create as large area of drought habitat as possible with this little amount of water. But it's also one idea was that because this is touristically important area, how to create a nice looking brook to this site. In the planning, we tried to utilize the length of the, of the channel to be as, as long as possible but also to create optimum habitats for, the, for this area. So you can see this, there are pools for, win, as for winter habitats and then different, different sections for, with different gradients. I'm thinking about spawning areas, spawning gravel areas, and then areas for different age stages of, of trout juveniles for for very young young fish and then for one and two years old old juveniles. We made the flow modeling to to see in average what are going to be the the velocities and the water depth there. So I, I haven't seen many times a modeling used for non existing examples, but here we tried also for research purposes to see how far can we estimate it in advance, what's going to be the circumstances for fish. And we made also habitat modeling there, and this is one, one picture showing that most of the channel will, should be good for, for trout juveniles, even with a, with a little amount of, of winter flow, 150 liters. And that's how it looked like during the construction. It had to be uh, uh, so, done so that it doesn't leak water to the ground because we don't know what is in, in, on the soil because it uh, dates back from the time of the construction of the power plant that, that you can see behind there. It had to be densified and there was one aqueduct made it was on, like a on replica of the old uh, log floating channel because this the site is rather st straight uh, site for for this channel. It is an old log floating channel site. So this was, it was made of wood that time. So there's one section that's made wood of wood, but it's going to be then covered by stone and gravel. And so this is the section how it mostly looks like there. And this is the part how it goes to the river under this uh, landscape uh, rapid. So the trouts have access from downstream section to this channel. Uh, the situation in this river, which is one of the, big, of the biggest rivers in Finland, because the total east part of the Finnish lake area flows through this river to Russia, to Ladoga Lake. Formerly it was a very important salmon river also, but now there are two power plants in the Russian side, but we hope that they are doing fish passes there, there with, within years, so also salmon could migrate up to here. So in future, possibly, it could be a, a spawning site for salmon also. And to conclude, uh, I would say that spawning and rearing channels, they are promising to revive fish stocks. So anyway, in Canada, they have got very good results and evidence for, for that they can revive the spawning uh, 
and juvenile production even to the state that it was before construction. They have evidence for that. And how far it is possible for Atlantic salmon, we don't know yet. But there are possibilities. And, and surely there are possibilities to enhance this and landscape impacts, thinking about this environmental flow. And that's why I would rather talk about envir environmental flow as, as, a, as a total concept and not only ecological flow. We know we need ecological flow for fish, but this landscape issue is more an environmental issue. In some countries in Europe, there's rather good legislation for habitat compensation, like in Germany, in Austria also, in Switzerland, but we don't have it in Finland. So, so we only talk about mitigation in the permits. And this is a question, how far, for instance, in Germany, this, uh, this compensation legislation works? There might be opinions here. This is a question from me. This political will, we, had, we already heard about good examples about political will. It's really important uh, thinking about these ecosystem services, not only, only thinking about hydropower. And tourism is in that sense very important. And these planning tools like modeling, they could help in decision making so that we can in advance show the, the, all, all the value and what could be done for the ecosystem services. Thank you.